we were unified and we didn't even consider them because we took care of ourselves in spite of them. Hold on, sis. Ho- hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on one second, sis. Hold on. Hold on before sure. <laughs> because I wasn't recording just yet. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. I was giving us an opportunity just to talk right quick, but yeah. I don't no 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 no. No, I don't press record. So 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 let me just read read the post so we can set it off and okay. uh uh um uh uh so I don't mispronounce your name. Can you say your name for me? Katari L. Okay, we we here live with the sister Katari L, and um, I just want to uh, uh, read this post that she had put up on social media, and it, it reads as follows. What happened to the mindset of our people that existed during the Harlem Renaissance, the United Negro Improvement Association, Pan-African Movement, and the Black Wall Street era? That unity and I am my brother's keeper era that build and protect our community, knowing your neighbors and celebrating life and togetherness. What happened to all of that? And we got the sister live right with us on the phone right now. Katari L. Um, yes. <laughs> please elaborate on such a powerful statement that you've, you posted. Um, okay, and uh, in my mindset, like I was explaining to you offline, uh, well, I'm on, I'll, I'll reiterate that in my mind, you know, I think about these things all the time, and it's so amazing to me how many of our people don't, but then that explains the social collapse that's happened amongst our own people. You know, there was a time when, in spite of Jim Crow, in spite of segregation, in spite of police brutality, in spite of all of that, we we still had a sense of community where we took care of each other and we looked out for each other. And we did that because we knew we had to protect each other. Like in the era of the Black Panthers who were created to protect and build programs for our people while, you know, systematically protecting us from the powers that be. But somewhere along the line that went away. And we don't talk about that anymore. Now it's every man for themselves. And nobody really wants to have accountability for the village, quote unquote, mentality anymore. And then I look at the media that we are exposed to via music, via television, via movies, via videos, where we are basically perpetuated as all these self-fulfilling ethnic notions, the mammy, the sambo, the coon, uh, uh, the whore, all of these things. Mm. And not only do the other people call it that, but we have engaged in self-degradation as a part of the music. If you look at the rap music, if you look at um, how we portray ourselves on video, if you look at how we portray ourselves on film, we have become a part of our own collective self-destruction. Wow. And Dr. Francis Cress Welsling, she said it herself. Hold on, while I'm talking, let me look up her quote. She said it herself um, that we are the ones who are um, self destructing. And wow. then um, I, I listened to the, uh, the song the other day, Self Destruction from the 80s, because their hip hop artists from the 80s saw this coming. They saw what was happening. Huh, let me see. Amongst our own people, and even back then, because hip hop means, uh, uh, well, hip hop started also, also as rap, as rhythm, and poetry. Back then, you saw a lot of more socio political statements in music. You saw a lot of pride in the music, to, to, as far as um, what we did right. uh, as a people. Okay. Um, okay, I found one of her quotes. Okay. Black people are being programmed through the media and television to really just focus on clowning and buffoonery and to be obsessed with sexual activity and not think, singing, dancing, and being obsessed with sex. This is diverting attention away from what is actually going on. Uh, so I sat back and I read 
also where she wrote, we're the only people on this entire planet who have been taught to sing and praise our demeanor. I'm a bitch. I'm a hoe. I'm a gangster. I'm a thug. I'm a dog. If you can train people to demean and degrade themselves, you can oppress them forever. You can even program them to kill themselves and they won't even understand what happened. Wow. So I sit back and I listen to the great thinkers like Dr. Francis Cross Wilson, mm-hmm. Dr. Ben, um, uh, um, John Henry Clark, um, uh, what's the other guy? Hold on a second. John Henry Clark and Amos Wilson. And I listen and I read their words and I'm like, wow, these people, they were so ahead of their time, but they saw what was coming. You know what I mean? Right. And I also look at the mentality of the original Black Panthers. They put their lives on the line and they risked everything because they wanted to make sure that sense of community that we had stayed and remained. But look at us now. Mm. Like we, we don't we don't even care anymore. The sense of mm. apathy amongst black people. As black people are trying to say black lives matter to everyone else. Well we're going out here degrading and demeaning each other, killing each other, doing all kinds of stuff to each other. But you only see protests if a cop does something. Right. Or you only see protests if somebody else but what happens to the village mentality where we are supposed to protect ourselves from threats that are both foreign and domestic. So that means we're supposed mm. to police amongst our own. No doubt. It's not there anymore. Wow. We don't care collectively about education, about, you know, building your progeny. You know, you look at, I hear people all the time talking about how, you know, welfare is what separated the man from the home, and women took the welfare, uh, and if you take welfare, you can't have a man in the home. But I was like, wait a minute, because back in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, before all that was there, men were more responsible and cared about their property. They weren't just dropping kids everywhere. Right. They weren't just having and laying and having babies with anybody and then abandoning the child and then you have women who are equipped to take care of the child mentally, physically, or emotionally but then you come out and it becomes a vicious cycle Mm. so it's like what do you do as a people how do we fix that how do we get back to the era of Marcus Garvey Right. Well, I, I researched Marcus Garvey that man had a third grade education and he built the UNIA and I could go over all the accomplishments Marcus Garvey's had, and it would blow people's minds. Mm. Those people felt like a core. They, so Marcus Garvey didn't care anything about your religious affiliation. He didn't care about any ideology you had. His sole primary purpose was if you are a melanated person, we are going to build each other. We're going to build together. Right. Yes, he fought the pan-Africanism, but he also said, you don't have to go back to Africa. Let's build some stuff here. So if you want to stay here, you have something that we built as a people. Right. But that's not here anymore. Mm. Like, what happened? You know, and I seriously sit back and and I ponder, what happened to us? Now, and it's like, can you go ahead, sir? Now, when you say, now when you say, uh, I mean, you you said a whole lot, but when you say uh, things like uh, we we are self destructing, um, we are. <laughs> I I doubt very seriously that the black community actually is acknowledging that. Yep. But see, you know what I go back to? Anytime I have a conversation, do you mind really quick if I list the things that Marcus Garvey did? Absolutely not. Black community? Absolutely. Marcus go. Garvey built, here we go. One, Marcus Garvey built factories, and his factories made clothes, and they also made black dolls for black kids to play with. Two, he built a hotel. Three, he built a chain of grocery stores. Four, his organization had their own trucking company. Five, he built schools. Six, he built restaurants. Seven, his organization had their own printing press. Eight, he started newspapers. Nine, his main newspaper was called The Negro World, and the newspaper was published in English, Spanish, and French. Ten, his organization bought three ships, and they started practicing international trade and commerce. 11, Marcus Garvey's organization owned office building. 12, his organization also bought, um, bought an auditorium in New York, and that's where Garvey did most of his speaking, and that place was called Liberty Hall. 13, by 1922, Marcus Garvey's organization had 6 million members. That's 6 million melanated mm. black people. Mm. His 
2019, his organization had over 900 branches in 40 different countries. Wow. In 2015, Marcus Garvey also started his own political party, and he named it the People's Political Party. 16, Marcus Garvey was the first black leader that changed the mindset of black people. He taught blacks to love themselves, and he taught us to be proud of what that God made us. 17, Kwame Nkrumah became the first president of Ghana, and he, he said... He became the first president of Ghana, and he said that Marcus Garvey was his hero and his biggest influence. The crewman named Ghana's shipping line the Black Star Shipping Line in honor of Marcus Garvey. He also named Ghana's soccer team the Black Stars. 18, Joma Kenyatta became the first president of Kenya, and he also said that Marcus Garvey was a major influence on him. 19, Nandi uh, Azikwe, I think I said that right, became the first president of Nigeria and said that Marcus Garvey was a major influence on him. He said that reading Garvey's Negro world shaped his view. That's the newspaper. 20. Julius Nayeri became the first president of Tanzania, and he also said that Garvey's teaching was a major influence. 21. Patrice Lumumba was influenced by Marcus Garvey. 22. Malcolm X's mother joined Marcus Garvey's organization when she was 19 years old. Yeah. Malcolm's parents met each other at the Universal, the UNIA convention in Montreal, Canada in 1919. They later got married. They were active members of Marcus Garvey's organization. His father was the president of the UNIA in Omana, the Nebraska. That's Malcolm X's father. Wow. 23, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, praised Marcus Garvey. He said that Garvey was the forerunner and laid the foundation for what the Nation of Islam is doing. That's he right. said that they are carrying on the work of Garvey. 24, historian Dr. John Henry Clark said that Marcus Garvey was one of the greatest minds ever produced. Mm. Now, we're talking about a man with a third-grade education. Marcus Garvey did all of that without any help from white people or the government. And he did it with a third-grade education. He did this during a time when there were no televisions or computers. The television wasn't even invented until 1927. Right. Now, if this man can do all this without media, and he can go nationally and internationally, and he evokes people, to stand up to themselves and to look at themselves a certain way. What is wrong? <laughs> what in the world in this age of media, social media, um, uh, television, print media, in this age of phones, like, what are we doing? Mm. <laughs> what are we doing? Now, now perhaps, perhaps the black community is afraid to succeed. Uh, you know what? I think that it, it, here's the thing. You know, when you look at you look at how we portray ourselves, we have fallen prey to all these stereotypes that we expose ourselves to via the videos, via the rap lyrics. I mean, you can't listen to a song now, or, or even like sometimes say I'm on social media and all you see is like a bunch of black men say a bitches be like or these hoes. And I'm like, is that how you refer to black women in general? <laughs> Right. You know what I mean? Right. Or they, they say stuff like, okay, these bitches are $40. Or they don't even talk about relationships, families, or anything anymore. Right. We are psychologically doing the damage of destroying our families for ourselves. And we're not even realizing it. And you have these paid actors, these paid uh, performers, these paid entertainers who also participate in these roles. And people look up to them. So if you're being bombarded with this all over the place, I think it's complacency. It's apathy. Absolutely. There's no need for fear when people are apathetic, because if you're apathetic, you just don't care. You just don't care. Absolutely. In order to be afraid, you have to care, and you have to want to change something. You have to want to do something. But if you don't care, then what are you afraid of? Because you're not going to fight for anything. You're right. going to be complacent. You're going to be comfortable exactly where you are. You don't want to change. You don't see a benefit in changing. And that's why whenever I hear people scream reparations, I'm like, what? Y'all going to run back and get the money to the Koreans anyway? <laughs> you going to get to the man. You going to go out here spending all the labels and get the money. Why? You ain't going to buy no land. You ain't going to invest in no business because you out here trying to flop and flex and look fly and all kinds of craziness. You ain't looking to learn how to farm, get some land, grow your own fruits and vegetables. You're not looking to do nothing. So guess what? Yes, they gave it to the Jews because the Jews actually actually took their stuff serious. Now, look what we do. Our people, uh, another one of the things that's one of my greatest pet 
believe that this race draft draft trade, if we trivialize our own race, what makes people think other people are going to take us serious? Right. You get mad at a black person, and oh, we're going to trade them for some white person. Excuse me? You don't even care enough about your own race that you're willing to cancel out one of your own and invite in a white person in their place. Mm. That's real. We will not want to us down, period. So you want to take the white man in, but you talk about Black Lives Matter, excuse me? So you don't agree with somebody? Like, I don't have a problem with Kanye. Kanye is an individual. I like him. He speaks his mind. He's a nonconformist. So when I see them say, oh, we're going to trade Kanye in for such and such white person, I'm like, what? Because he has a different <laughs> thought pattern right, than you. Right. He didn't do anything to you. He hasn't hurt anyone. He actually has organizations and foundations, and he does a lot in the community, charity-wise. Right. Right. But because you don't agree with a statement he made, you are trivializing and saying that you're going to take his ethnicity from him and give it to a white person. Mm. Mm-hmm. How asinine does that sound? How? Then you want to invite all the white people to the cookout? Like, wait. Right. <laughs> now you're expelling black people left and right, taking black cards. What other way do people do that? So when they're giving the money to reparations to the Jews, and when they gave the money to the Asians, that's because they actually took their oppression serious. Mm-hmm. They're not playing the victim. They feel like you owe us, you hard us, right. and you're going to pay. But because of how we are, they don't even take themselves serious. Yeah, we we still we still haven't even uh, taken ourselves serious enough for anybody to take us serious. Nope. Thank you, and that's why you know. Again, I do work um, in DC, and I, I, one of the things I do is I work within um, some of the major inner cities uh, in the ward six, seven, and eight, and so with some of the poorest uh, population. And when I sit there and I look, I'm just like, oh, my God. Uh, there's a class that I taught at Job Corps. You know what Job Corps is? Right. Okay. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the youth there, there between 16 and 24. And you talk about law. These people. You said lost? Lost. Wow. L-O-S-T. Wow. Literally. Wow. You talk about, in class, you're talking to them. Some of them have started doing drugs as young as seven and I'm like, where did you get drugs from? Well, my mother had to lay around the house. <laughs> if she had, she wow. ain't going to know if I took one. And I'm just like, why are you getting hot? They were like, a she ain't let me. They were getting beat. They wasn't eating. They had to take care of themselves. Nobody cared about them. Wow. Some of them just came to job so, so they wouldn't be homeless. And I'm sitting there like, oh, my God. When you listen to their life stories, you start to understand, okay, it's going to be a cycle. They didn't. They weren't raised to the point where they were supposed to be responsible human beings. They can tell you anything about street culture and street life, but when it came to certain values and mores and uh, uh, certain certain morals, they were supposed to be entranced. Well, like I, I think back to when I was young, like we had standards like in the seventies and eighties. Right. My people didn't play that, but so we had a very strong sense of community. Literally. Anybody on our block could discipline you because everybody knew each other. Right. We weren't transient, moving all around. You know what I mean? You grew up with the people that were there. And then when you got older, you go back to visit all the people who were there. That sense of community is lost. Now you, 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 and when you, I started... You're definitely touching on some things. Now, you got one type of uh, child who, who, who you can kind of give some compassion to, some understanding as to yeah. why they are the way that they are. But then you have another type of child who, who, who has their parents and they still wind up trying to be something other than what they were raised to be. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like this thing has become, you know, to, to be ignorant has become an actual uh, fad. When I look at like the, the rappers and I look at the entertainers, that is praised amongst black people. Right. It's like the thing to do, the thing to be, the sambo, the cook, all that stuff. That, that stuff is supposed to be cool now. Right. To be ignorant. Look at these people running around, um, uh, sipping on lean. What the heck? That's part of my choice. What? <laughs> what is that? When they teach you in music videos how to self destruct. Right. Right. When did that become cool when you turn on TV and all the people that you so-called have 
as a representation of you is derogatory. Well, let me ask you this, sis. Let me ask you this. We reaching our 20 minute mark, but let me ask you is, you know, time go fast when you're dropping them bombs. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me ask you this right quick. If you, if there was any level of, uh, uh, um, any level of advice that you have that you could offer the listeners, what would you say would be, um, I know, it, 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 you know, in, in, in as many uh, uh, words as, as you have, what would be your level of advice to, to, to those listening um, to a- actually absorb the problem and uh, 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 deal with, deal with it with a solution? You know what? That is a major question. And the first thing I think people have to do is stop and realize what is actually going on and start asking themselves some deep reflecting questions. Like, what happened? You got to start there. What ha- to actually sit and think about what happened to us mm. as a people. Right. And then once you start saying that to yourself, start learning about our people, the people like Marcus Garvey, the Black Panther. You have to look for motivation and people that will help you understand their way of thinking. You right. have to look into that. Book of T. Washington. Look into those kind of people. You know what I mean? Once you do that, try to find a way to find something in your in your community or start joining organizations or just start finding places where like-minded people are gathering together. I mean, because it, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. So people have... I, I, I just, uh, it's too big of a question. Like, so you say, you say, do, do some first research. Thing I would do some, first, first, you have to awaken yourself and start asking yourself some questions about what happened to us. Once you start asking yourself these questions, that builds the preponderance in your mind to be like, okay, let me go back and let me look at history. Mm. Start looking at history and start researching. And then once you do that, I, I, I mean, it's a matter of getting in touch with like-minded people and start entertaining your mind with things that emphasize community right. building, community awareness, and then start putting yourself in places and spaces with people who are like-minded. Right. I mean, because outside of that, <laughs> nothing's going to happen. But it all starts with asking your questions. Why are we this way? What mm. happened to us? Right. How did we get here? Right. Because until you start questioning, you're just going to be stagnant. You have to ask why and how and what. And who? Right. So no, who, what, where, where, how? Like, once you ask yourself those five questions, you sit back and start to ponder on it, then that'll start sparking some things in you. So we basically have to deal with the who, what, how and why. Who? Yes. There you go. There you go. All right, sis. Well, listen, we got to get up out of here, but I really, really appreciate you, um, you. you know, sharing your views with us. Very powerful. And I am definitely going to be um, staying in communication with you. Um, perhaps uh, what we probably need to start doing is the conscious need to start actually linking and not separating. So, um, social social media can be used as a powerful tool and um Absolutely. because of that we have powerful jewels from sister like yourself today we on the line with sister Katari L WNT9 radio we'll be back <laughs> WNT9 talk radio WNT9 Talk Radio Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-